from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Stu Miniman. Hi, and welcome to a special presentation of the Cube here from our East Coast studio. And uh, happy to jo have joining with me Bob Ellis. Uh, Bob is the founder and chief consultant of Analyze, Innovate, and Transform. Uh, Bob, be before I, I, I want to have you introduce yourself, but for our audience, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about uh, kind of digital transformation, and there's so many things that go into that. Everything from you know, kind of mobile, how things like cloud. Uh, you know, I tend to focus a lot on kind of the infrastructure and cloud pieces out of it, so very much some of the tool set. Uh, but I think with you, we're also going to be talking about kind of the, the organizational, the processes, the mindset, uh, some of those great organizational pieces, which you know I, I, I like too. But uh, wh wh why don't you uh, introduce? yourself to our audience, you know, your background and, and what you do today. Sure, Stu, thank you very much. So yeah, like many of us in the industry, engineering background and management science um, degree, MS from MIT. And the discussion here is really about enterprise agility. And there's a third leg of innovation. The third leg of innovation that I'd like to talk about is, as we all know, the technology innovation um, is phenomenal. The, um, in the industry, there's in tremendous technology innovation. There's amazing product innovation. There's new products coming out all the time. There's uh, product innovation is, is also amazing. I will claim that the third frontier of management and, and our industry and sustainability of larger corporations is really management innovation. And that's, that's what, what I want to talk about today. Right, so, so Bob, you're, you're a consultant today. Yes. Um, and can you talk about, you know, what is the, the typical company you're dealing with? Is this something, you know, is it startups? Is it, you know, global enterprises? You know, what, what, what's the client? Sure, that sure, talking? that's a very good question, yeah. Stu. The, um, typically what happens, the startups are all, well, many of them are successful, right? They, they have the, in, the innovators, lots of innovation going on. It's typically a small group of people. Communication is very clean. Um, as companies grow, they tend to get larger, more people, more communication challenges. There's specialties within those organizations. And when you start looking at workflow through these companies and through the systems, and the workflow is really the value flow, um, they tend to get constrained through that management system. And that really is what enter enterprise agility is about, is understanding what that system is, innovating in that space, and accelerating that value flow through the system so those, those companies can remain competitive. Yeah, uh, it, it's definitely a huge thing we've been hearing for many years now. I mean, agility is, is really what we're talking about, uh, being able to react faster um, and being able to understand it. Uh, how, you know, IT for the longest time has been, uh, you know, it, it was a cost center, it was, you know, the group that would tell you no or, you know, slow roll things. So how much of this is kind of IT focused? How much of it is kind of a, a broader, uh, you know, c company uh, d development? Great. So. Um, so it's interesting, agility, agile, scrum, these terms have kind of grown up around the world of IT and, and software product development. Um, they actually apply to all value streams of a company. Um, you can be in weather forecasting and try to figure out how to get your weather forecast out faster or depending on what, your, what value it is that your, your, uh, your company is delivering to your people, um, to the customers. And so it's really the value stream that matters and the, the responsiveness really comes down to how fast can you move from an idea or a concept to the value delivered to the customer and adopt it. Um, so it, it may include, like you mentioned CICD, you mentioned DevOps, There's, um, it's, it's about getting that value to the customer and deployed to the customer so that they can actually be using that value and, and ultimately paying for that value, if, as, assuming that you're, whatever you're providing is something you're charging. Yeah, so, so Bob, uh, like yourself, I've got an engineering background. I remember back in undergrad, you know, you talk about the manufacturing revolution. So mm -hmm. uh, what Justin Time and Lean talked about taking inefficiency out of the system and being able to kind of meet the customers, uh, you know, at the time they need it, when they need it. Um, it, it sounds a lot like what we're talking about, uh, you know, if, fr from a technology standpoint. Exactly, so when it, so yeah. I, I've been in industry for many decades and um, my, my first work out of uh, business school, I got into management consulting. And the consulting then was really the manufacturing systems. And you would go into these companies and it would be about over the wall into manufacturing. And it's interesting because the, the software and the agility in software and Scrum and waterfall and you know comparing waterfall, for example, to the agile and, and Scrum processes, it's it's no longer about dev handing over the wall or to a different organization to test and then 
another one over the wall to the release people that are doing stabilization tests. Um, the idea is that the scrum cycles, the iterations or sprints, are all of that is done um, in every two week period or every one week period. So the idea is you have potentially shippable product at the end of every iteration. And so with that, you get a lot of feedback into your system, which, can, which allows you to be agile in terms of addressing new markets and new needs. You might discover new technology things that need to be done. There, there may be improvements in the process that are revealed. And the whole idea is these, these feedback loops and the PDCA give the, the teams that have been working on these things, if they analyze and understand those, they can improve what they're delivering. And so you can actually get faster value delivery to your customer. You can get more on target to your customers. You can, the, um, we, the results of, of experiencing these systems is phenomenal between, you know, when you're going from, from a, say, a six month waterfall process where there might be some feedback in that system, but the really crisp feedback of working softer to customers to getting, um, you know, demonstration in terms of exactly how it's working. Um, the, f the feedback cycles in an agile system are much, there, there are just many, many more of them. And so you, the system becomes much more responsive. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned the feedback cycles. You know, we've definitely been hearing, uh, you know, when I can change those, uh, those cycle times, if, uh, you know, the feedback loops help me, uh, whether I'm talking about data and how I interact with my customers or uh, just internally how, uh, you know, when I'm setting goals, you know, you don't just set a yearly goal and, and go do it anymore. You've got to be uh, a, a little bit tighter on there. Can you talk about some of kind of the optimizations, how customers, you know, determine, you know, where they make the optimizations, whether that's, you know, very fine grained, very broad grained, uh, uh, you know, how, how does that? Yeah, happen? very interesting. Yeah. So there's a lot of frameworks out in industry. There's the Scrum framework, which a lot of people have heard about. There's some scaling frameworks that are out there, and there, there are multiple different frameworks. The bottom line is every company is a unique value stream that it's delivering. And through understanding what that value stream is and also the culture of the business, because when you're changing the way that people are doing work, you're really uh, affecting, you're touching the, uh, the culture of the organization and, and the intrinsic motivators of the people. Because people may be you know, super specialized, super expert in one area, and then you're asking them, for example, to work instead of as an individual, maybe you're asking them to work as a team, and the team has deliverables within this iteration that include development and test and stabilization. And so some of the, and the idea is that the team is working together and the people are helping each other on that team to meet the team deliverables. And so it, it does affect the intrinsic motivators and, and through innovation and, and helping the organizations and the people understand what those intrinsic motivators are and to broaden their intrinsic motivators even so that instead of just having a very tight area of, of expertise, for example, um, they encourage them to be innovators. And, you know, innovate outside of your box and get the people to really innovate and get fulfillment through innovation even beyond their area of expertise. And once that becomes an intrinsic motivator and, and then the culture starts changing and then the organization can change. And, and ultimately we want to get these organizations to a mindset where it's not just a new process that they're delivering against, but the, the, business, the business being all of the people in that organization are are really conscious and cognizant of the workflow or the value flow through the system and how can the, the organization accelerate that value flow through the system. And it can be all sorts of different impediments that are slowing that system down. And Stu brought up earlier like DevOps, for example, is, is traditionally a, a, big, um, a big friction point in, a, in terms of delivering software where you see some companies like Google and Facebooks that are deploying every day to customers. You know, how do these other companies that are on these release schedules that maybe every quarter, or every six months they're releasing and, and how can we accelerate through that release cycle so that we can have faster and faster releases? And, and so it's, uh, it's all understanding that system, innovating, trying things, having, uh, having an organization that gives you the opportunity to try these things if, you, if they're not good ideas, you fail fast on them and you move back. And, and the idea is to leverage every person in those organizations so that, so that the organization can move fast. So, so that's really interesting because, God, I, I think from a manufacturing standpoint, it seems like, you know, people were just another piece of the equation. You know, I, I think back when, you know, I took some Six Sigma classes and it was just like, you know, let's take variants out of there and let's, you know, get everything more efficient. But understanding motivation is critical.
cycle. Uh, Simon Sinek did a, a video recently that's kind of been all over the web talking about millennials, and they said they will trade off, you know, being part of something bigger and you know helping, you know, the cause as opposed to just purely from a monetary standpoint. Um, so, you know, do, do, do you, does your consultancy, do you help companies? How are they at kind of understanding and motivating people? I mean, we know for the longest time, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, only 20% of employees are fully, you know, engaged and interested in their work. Most people kind of show up, punch the clock, you know. Yeah. And automation and other things are exactly. all just making it like less and less likely that you're going to want to be engaged in the work. Yeah, we're really, so the, the models, the frameworks absolutely support self-organizing, self-managing teams. And all of that has to do with the, the motivators, right? Understanding what those motivators are, collectively having that joint respect across the individuals within that team. And there are different roles within that team, by the way. There, in, in the Scrum framework, for example, there's the, there's the product owner who owns the business decisions. So they're really deciding what is the priority of doing the, the work that's in the backlog. The team, or the team of, of de typically developers and testers, um, those are, the, those are the technical experts, and so that's a, a second role, and that team essentially defines the work. They clarify, the, they negotiate the, the definition of the work with the product owner, um, and then they decide how much work they can do in that iteration, and then they figure out amongst themselves and mostly technology innovation in terms of how to actually deliver that work um, to the definition of done um, by the end of the iteration. And so, and then the, the scrum master typically is really the orchestrator or the facilitator. They're not a manager, right? They're more of a leader, or in some terminology, servant leader, where the idea is that you're enabling that team to execute, execute and deliver that value, identify and remove impediments from the system, um, and help that team execute against its mission. And so th th that triumvirate allows the, the, um, the team to operate very effectively because we know exactly where the authority is for certain decisions. Yeah. C c you know, what kind of training's involved in this? You know, most of the terms you throw out there is, you know, <laughs> I, I got a bachelor's in engineering, I got my MBA, um, you know, it's a little bit dated on some of this, but yeah. boy, that's not the things that kind of today's workforce is trained for. So yeah. uh, how, do they, how do they get involved? You know, maybe yeah. talk about, you know, the kind of the on-ramp and, you know, how do you scale an organization with this? That's great, you know? those are good questions as well. Train, training, there is definitely different terminology and as long as people have a common terminology, it's, it's easier for that organization to make shifts into the new space. Um, there is, there's the concepts like John Little of MIT introduced to industry really in systems manufacturing and end-to-end and, and systems is, is lean and, and how much work really in process affects how responsive the system, how fast can you get that work through the system. Um, depends on how much work is in that system. And if you can reduce how much work is in that system, um, you can actually produce that work more quickly and then replan the next iteration and you can be more responsive to the marketplace. So there, there's a lot of, um, I'll call it theory, there's a lot of practice, there's a lot of just basic terminology that needs to be agreed upon so that everybody can communicate and execute as effectively as possible and also continue to make improvements. Right, because the ultimately the where we want to get the organizations from a consulting standpoint is to adopt the mindset of of continuous improvement. So, and everybody in that mindset, so everybody can can contribute ideas and improve how the system will work. Now, with that said, sometimes there are centralized decisions that are more efficient than distributed decisions, and so when that is recognized. Um, then the teams need to agree and, and follow suit that yes, this is a, a you know a centralized decision and and we're going to follow suit on that one example that might be the start and end day of an iteration because you want your teams to to execute together. All right, Bob, uh, let, let's talk about you know what what are the metrics? What comes out of this? You know, company goes through it. You know, what can they start saying? You know, uh, they're they're more profitable, they're more competitive. You know, what what are kind of the the hero numbers that they come out of this with? Sure, absolutely. So uh, some of the primary metrics. Um, I'm glad you asked that question because having the manufacturing background, I'm, I've been all about metrics my <laughs> whole life, right? So so you have predictability really important for, for big companies that have planned releases that are every six months or so. We all know what it is. If we miss a GA date, we do not want to miss a GA date. Part of that predictability is also delivering against the features that we're committed to in the plan. 
So you want to always be delivering against your highest value features and against your, whatever your committed plan is, which is N minus X months before your, your delivery. As your release cycle gets shorter and shorter, your predictability actually um, becomes less important because you just have a constant flow of releases and flow of value to your customers. So that, that particular measure actually changes over time, but it does consciously, it, it's a function of how quickly you, you can release um, your cadence to release to your customers. So another one is productivity. So productivity is a very interesting one, because if you look at the, these frameworks on the surface, it's like, okay, where's my productivity gonna come from, right? So there are, there are organizational behavior theories that are implemented in many of these practices. And for example, there's a daily stand-up meeting, which a lot, of, a lot of these teams, when they're first starting Scrum, they don't really understand the benefit of having a daily stand-up. They think this is a status meeting. What that meeting is really about is it's maximizing the communication bandwidth between the developers and testers so that they can collaborate and figure out how to deliver their work item, which is typically a, a total effort of one or two days of work. That's how small these work items are as when they're defined effectively. Um, and they're literally, it's a collaboration between these people and they, they want to get up and they want to have that, that scrum meeting or the daily stand up um, and have that collaboration so they can figure out who's doing what during the, the next 12 hours or, or whatever hours you're before the next one, um, the next 24 hours usually. Although some people aren't working at night all the time, right? Of course, in fact, it, that's a, actually a good point is too, is this is about sustainable delivery. It's not about asking people to work harder. It's about asking people to work in a smarter framework, and smarter meaning the framework is designed from a management standpoint to be more effective. Yeah, you hear some of these words, sprint, scrum, <laughs> things like that. Oh, Jesus, am I going to yeah. be working 20 hours a day? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it, so it, it's not about working harder, it's about working smarter. And so the collaboration is, is, is one area where there's more effective communication so you don't have all these emails and delays going back and forth between the same kinds of people. Um, another one is context switching. If you eliminate the work in process so that your dev test team right, is working on just a few work items at a, at a point in time, they're not context switching. And context switching has been studied to create as much as 40% of, of overhead for a team that's delivering work. So if you can eliminate, say, even half of that or two-thirds of that, that is a huge bonus in productivity, right? Another one is quality. Quality is feedback cycles, right? More feedback cycles, you get more quality. You can define that quality as bugs downstream. You can define that quality as customer feedback that you're getting earlier because you're, you're able to demonstrate software earlier. And through those feedback cycles, you, you still prioritize all the work um, and that, that Basically, there, there might be a core feature that you're delivering against, but you might get feedback from your downstream uh, demos, et cetera, um, that you want to, and the business, on the, the PO will prioritize that work for one of the upcoming sprints to execute against. And so you, the quality system is phenomenal. Another part of the quality system, as the scrum teams um, evolve, the impediments go through phases. Right. Initially, the impediment is typically the backlog and getting the backlog of work items really clean and well-defined so that the teams can execute against that. The next large kind of category is the flow of the work through the system. Because even in a one or two week iteration period, the team will have kind of the natural tendency to still batch their work. So they'll do all the development in the first week and then do all the tests in the second week and then everything hopefully gets delivered in the last day and the integration domain and all that happens in the last day. And what the teams learn is over time that that system can actually be improved by doing your dev and test on one work item in your integration and then move to the next one to the next one. So maybe there'll be two or three work items in process for a f four or five dev test team, um, which would have a couple more of the PO and the scrum master for a total team of uh, seven. Um, that's typically the flow is the next impediment. The third imp impediment is the technical practices. And this is where the DevOps comes in and the CI CD comes in. It's like, okay, how quickly can we integrate this new code and the new test that we just wrote? Um, automated tests are typically a definition of done, right? Into that CI CD suite so that we can have constant coverage on, on our current, our check-ins, as well as everyone else who's contributing toward the same product. So those teams can get fast feedback. 
So you have the, the, the technical practices are your third area of impediment, and then your, the next area of impediments actually come down to organizational impediments. You know, things like, is the team motivated as a team, or are we still motivating individuals as heroes and heroics are, are rewarded as an organization? And so some of those organization impediments are, are the impediments that ultimately drive the organization toward the mindset so that they can ultimately become the, the agile enterprise across all of their work streams. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a journey. It's not something that organizations can just do on day one and move into it on day two or even hire a team of consultants um, to come in and, and do a transformation, right? It's, it's hard. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural change and it takes a lot of energy, a lot of investment, a, a true understanding by the leaders of the company um, to understand that management innovation and responsiveness to the marketplace really is that third frontier of industry competitiveness and it will help our the, the high-tech companies which are faced with all sorts of disruptions and new technologies oh my god it, you know outsourcing to low-cost regions there's all these things that are going on that disrupt the technology industry and through so my hypothesis here is that it, is that the, it's through management innovation and implementation and really learning and sharing these learnings with the industry as a whole will move us further as as a, as an industry in terms of delivering value to our end customers. Well, Bob, it, it's great. You went through a bunch of the challenges there. I, I, I'm curious, you know, in the companies you, you've worked with, you know, are people ready for this? You know, are there generational issues? If somebody's been at a company for 10 years, do they just have the antibody built in and, you know, they need to move and do something else and we have to bring in a new workforce? Or, you know, how do companies in reality work through some of these issues? It, so it's hard. Yeah. It, it's, so a lot of what you see out there, if you just go into any high tech company, you'll see teams like grassroots, teams will be trying this in general. Um, you'll also have leadership which um, has different levels of buy-in. Some of the leadership will be like, okay, you're the development organization, you're responsible, just hit your delivery dates, and you know, if you don't do that, well, we're gonna like talk, right? And then other, other leaders, the more progressive leaders, are really understanding that it is their responsibility to manage this, the end-to-end -end delivery system of the value stream and to start s seeking out what are those opportunities to, to, as an organization, to invest in those things so that we can have that higher velocity flow through the system and fewer impediments and be as responsive to our customer base as we need to be given our whatever market segment and industry that we're in. And I'll, I'll claim that every one of those different market segments has different challenges. And so the leaders need to understand the value streams that, that, you, that you guys are all delivering against your your, uh, your, for your business on behalf of your customers, and how do you remain competitive in your marketplace? Yeah, a and absolutely. Um, you know, one of the, the hypotheses out there, I mean, this isn't just a high-tech problem, right? I mean, this is, you know, if you're a 150-year-old financial institution, you know, you're going to have a lot more software now uh, in, in your environment. Uh, absolutely. So, so, you know, is there anybody that this isn't for, or is this, you know, as, as you go forward, is, you know, what, what, what's your viewpoint? Yeah, so I, so just kind of looking at industry in general, the financial services firms are really, they're, they're actually what I would call leaders in adoption in this space, right? The product innovators, you have the, you know, the ones like Google and, and Facebook and those that are the online websites, they're, they are like figured it out. They, they figured out how to do all this really continuous flow of value delivery. Um, the product companies that are on release cycles have more of a challenge and they're, they're beginning to get it and they're beginning to understand that this really is a competitive weapon and that they can go in and implement more greater responsiveness and strategically position themselves to essentially have a higher value company because now you can get to market when there's disruptive technologies facing you. You can shift faster than the, than the market itself is shifting. You can deliver your products now to, their, to your customers before the customer changes their minds. And ultimately it's all about market share and, and early adoption and getting that product out to market as quick, absolutely as quickly as possible.
Great. Uh, last question I have for you, Bob. Uh, two two parter is you know what I, I want you to talk to the C suite and kind of you know your your, your advice to to the C suite as well as kind of take take the average worker, somebody who's been you know out there doing stuff five to ten years. You know what do you see as some kind of you know real growth opportunities for them in their career? Going sure, forward? absolutely. Yeah. So from a C suite standpoint, um, if you think about concept to cash ultimately is your value stream. If you can get your concept to cash on a faster cycle, you don't need as much investment to get there, right? I mean, that, that's, that's ultimately the, the CFO, the, the CEO, the, the VC community, right? Faster time to market, faster value delivered, and you have a business that has higher value, right? Even, you know, e taking away, don't even talk about the market share gains, but just the, the um, the ability to get market more quickly. Another big factor in these systems is quality, right? Because you have such fast feedback in the system, you the quality, typically the, the number of bugs, like when companies implement this, literally the number of bugs after integration goes down by like numbers like 50% of bugs go away. It, it's a huge, huge changer, right? Market share gains. If you can if you can grab another one or two points of market share, you tell me what what will that do to the to the valuation of your business, right? And it it's there's there's different ways of looking at these things. Life cycle profits ultimately is the is the measure that I like to use in terms of measuring the value of the business, and that ultimately could be you know driven from this system as well as all sorts of improvements to delivering that value more quickly. That is really what you're driving, is the, is the life cycle profits, which ultimately the C-suite, again, I'm sure is interested in, is the valuation of the companies. So it absolutely drives to the valuation of the companies. In terms of the individual um, contributors, the, the awesome innovators of, of these companies that we have, all the technology people, the engineers, the developers, the testers, the automated testers, what I would encourage people there is, is really understand not only the um, technology environment, the product environment, but look at your develop delivery system. How can you deliver um, more quickly, right? How can you look at that system from an end to end? What's creating bugs downstream? What's creating more work downstream? Where are the batch processes? Batch processes slow things down. Batches can be anything like, you know, I want to do a big, huge check-in before I merge to main, or it can be just a large work item, right? I want to have a, you know, twenty-person day work item instead of a one to two day, uh, you know, person day work item. Those are batches of work, and fat, smaller batches move that work through the system more quickly. And so, if you look at it from a management um, process standpoint, um, and think about it as innovation. Right, we're all innovators. We love. We're all creative people at heart. Right, I, you know, anybody that's not an innovator, right, it's, it gives fulfillment to anybody who is. And I encourage everybody to innovate. And this is a ripe area to innovate and learn. Of course, it's not only about innovation and 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 understanding theories, but it, wherever you can practice some of these things, you're contributing not only to your company, but you're contributing to yourself as well in your career and the longevity of our of the of the company that you're working in and the uh, the industry as a whole. So that's that's my short answer to your questions. Awesome. Well, Bob, uh, you know, really appreciate you coming and sharing this. Uh, you know, in the past, often we'd say enterprise agility. That was an oxymoron, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, it, it, it's heartening to look at kind of 2017 and looking forward uh, that there's this opportunity for deeper engagement, uh, more innovation, and yeah, time to value is you know crucial. So you know, agility and the feedback loops and everything else. So uh, thanks so much for joining us, and thank you for watching the Cube. Check out SiliconAngle.tv. Uh, for all the video and wikibon.com for all the research.